Before we go into the actual text and talk about the whole philosophy of the 33 Steps, let me give you a little bit of background about myself. Up until the age of 11, I was raised in Africa. It was a very, very liberal existence. Basically, I played on the beach. In fact, I cannot remember any school that I went to before I was 11. I'm sure I must have gone to some schools, but I've forgotten them. That's how much impact they had upon me. I cannot remember the name of a school, any of the children that were there, the classrooms, the teachers. School was not my trip until I was 11 years old anyway. So I was hanging out on the beaches of Africa, and then I was sent to an old English boarding school, one of those real old, old mausoleums that have been there since the beginning of time. It was really strict, and it was loveless and grim, and had loads of rules, and an enormous amount of restriction. I stayed at the school from the age of 11 to 17, and by the time I got out, I was keen, real peachy keen, on discovering freedom. I thought to myself, hey, I've had freedom in Africa, then I had restriction. I've done restriction, I've graduated from restriction, now give me freedom again. So part of my journey in life has been discovering freedom. In my 20s, I decided that freedom came from money. I didn't know any better then, so I hurtled out and tried to make a pack of money as quickly as possible. In those days, in England, it was the back end of the swinging 60s, and things were really hopping and bopping. So if you were a lively lad, money came your way, and I made oodles of it. I was in the jeans business making 20,000 bucks a week, and that was in the olden days when a buck was still worth close to a buck. At that time, I was about 21 years old. But having loads of money so young was almost fatal. I went down the ego's path of self-destruction, drugs, sex, rock and roll, and all sorts of nihilistic activity that was guaranteed to kill you before you got to 30. Having done that and got the T-shirt 10 times over, I got to the ripe old age of 28 and decided, hey, wait a minute, there's got to be more to life than this. And that's what got me into my spiritual quest. I think for all of us, we have to have at some point the desire. Sometimes the great wonderful goodness that is the invisible universe around us delivers to us a change, a special turning point. In the film business, they call it a plot point, when suddenly 20 minutes into the film, something different happens. Well, some people have a plot point whereby they get terribly sick. For others, they have a plot point whereby they whack a tree, like at 70 miles an hour, say. That usually turns them around. Or there's a divorce. A death in the family, a bankruptcy, or something weird happens. Generally speaking, when the ego is ticking along and is very pleased with itself, it doesn't want to consider, and it won't allow you to consider, spirituality, different belief patterns, ancient wisdoms, consolidation of power, and personal disciplines, or the kind of stuff that is involved in the sacred quest. Usually what happens is you have to burn out all of the ego's options first, and then whack a tree. So when you read in the newspaper that four people whacked a tree last night, know that they're basically seeking their infinite self. Of course, listening to this study course and following the simple instructions is a lot safer. But some people are in a hurry to discover themselves, so they whack a tree instead. It's basically their desire to reach God. That's what they're doing. So you don't have to get too emotionally upset. It's just the process of arriving at God. They just did it rather quickly. Well, I did my arriving at God by 28, because by then I was really bored, really fed up, and totally psychotic. I mean, I was totally dysfunctional. One day, I did a very clever thing. I got rid of everything. I got rid of the Rolls Royce, the staff, all the hangers-on, and I gave what was left of my business to my partner. I had an apartment in London on Chelsea Embankment, which is a pretty kind of la di da area. I remember thinking one day, I want to leave. I want to be free. No more BS. I want things that are true and real and good. In the hallway of my apartment was a very expensive set of mirrors. So I rang up a friend of mine and said, send a guy with a van. I'm going to give you a gift of some mirrors. So he came along and unhooked all the mirrors and hauled them off. Then on the day when I left the apartment, and you've got to think in terms of this apartment being worth about $400,000 in today's money, the morning I left the apartment, I closed the door. I didn't cut off the telephone. I didn't cut off the electricity. I didn't write to the bank and explain to them why they weren't getting their mortgage. I didn't know them very much. And I had loads and loads of equity in the apartment, but I didn't care about the money. I didn't even eat the food in the refrigerator. Nothing. I left all my clothes and all of the furniture, bar the mirrors, of course, and I left the apartment like I was going around the corner to the 7-Eleven. I walked down the street and I made a right along Chelsea Embankment. And not far from the building was a little drain. And I unclipped the front door key of the apartment and dropped it down the drain. 
That's how much I wanted to change. I was leaving. And as I walked out of there and left, that was the beginning of my spiritual quest. I decided, hey, Stewie, it's time for something different. So anyway, luckily enough, I found a spiritual teacher who started teaching me about Taoism. What's so beautiful about Taoism is that it teaches you to detach. Not only to detach from the world emotion, the emotion of your family, the emotions of the people around you, but you learn to detach from your own emotions so that you're not so much a victim of what's going on inside of you. The beauty of this philosophy is it teaches you to observe your own reactions. It's almost like standing above yourself and watching what's going on rather than owning the whole opera. You can observe your urges, you can observe your disquiet. You're not so much a victim of your own stuff. Some of the material in this introductory session I originally touched upon in a book I wrote some years ago called The Force. In that book, I explain the whole idea of the infinite reality in all things, and I introduce the reader to the idea of the Taoist philosophy. The Tao is an interesting thing. It's a Chinese philosophy that comes from about 500 BC. It is actually written Taoist, tears in Tommy, A-O-I-S-T. So it's written Taoist and pronounced with a D, Taoist. That always confused the hell out of me, in the early days anyway. It came about because the people that studied the Chinese language in the early days tried to translate the Chinese sound into an English letter. And they never really did make up their mind whether it was Dao or Tao. So in the end, it's pronounced Dao and actually written Tao with a T. So you've probably seen the um, Tao Te Ching or Tao Te Ching in your local bookshop. The wonderful thing about it is that people buy the book and read it. It's all very flowery and they haven't got a clue what it means. And I must say, when I first started, I didn't either. But the beauty of the philosophy is that unlike a lot of religions, it doesn't have any rules. So it was naturally attractive to me. It has very simple concepts that are very inspiring and definitely take you from the world of ego, glamour and illusion into the spirituality of the infinite self. So I was very influenced by Taoism. The world of the ego is one of agony, pure agony for most people, because even when the ego is being kept happy, it's never really happy. You can give it a new car, you can give it a new snowmobile, some sexual experiences, you can get it drunk, you can stuff it full of food, and it wakes up the following morning and it nails a list of things to your forehead. It says, hey, sucker, get me this and get me that. I feel insecure. I want more of this and more of that. So the ego always leans towards dysfunction. You cannot possibly come to any kind of serenity in what the Eastern mystics call Maya, the illusion, in the ego-driven world. Of course, when you think about it, this physical plane is a glorious experience. From a spiritual perspective, we don't really have any negative energy on this plane. We only have the illusion of negative energy. Let me explain. All negative energy comes from the ego. In other words, what we call the negative experience is any contradiction of the ego's opinion. So any time that something happens in life that contradicts you, you'll consider you have suffered a negative experience. So you want to live a pain-free existence and you fall off the sidewalk and break your ankle. And there's a contradiction. You want a simple lifestyle with plenty of money, and the check bounces, you get laid off from your job, and there's another contradiction. You want a reasonable flow, reasonable happiness, reasonable gratification, and your spouse gives you a hard time, your kids drive you crazy, the boss is harassing you, and here are a few more contradictions. You want to be cozy and warm, and it's pelting down with rain. So what we as humans call negative experiences are really only contradiction of the ego's opinion. Emotional pain is all self-inflicted. It doesn't make it pleasant, but once you can see that it comes from the ego's decisions, you can begin to heal it and heal it quickly. So in my method, there are no real absolutes. In other words, it's an illusion to say we've got to be cozy. We've got to be safe. We've got to be rich. 
We've got to be healthy. We've got to live forever. That's another one of the ego's special legislations, isn't it? You may live forever, and you may not. The point about living forever is, there is no point in living forever if you live in a TikTok prison. There's no point in living forever if your life is a complete dysfunctional mess. It's better that you live a week or two as a realized, free, totally serene, loving human being than living 80 years in the mayhem of the ego. How long you live is irrelevant. It's the quality of life while you're alive that matters. If today was your last day on earth, the only tragedy would be if you hadn't experienced life properly, if you'd never allowed yourself to actually live it. What's the point of life if the whole of it has been one of pain, anguish, dysfunction and worry? That's useless. But if you've managed to reconcile yourself, if you've looked within, if you've reclaimed this infinite power within you, then all of a sudden you can say, yeah, yeah, Stu, I've done it. I got there. I got the t-shirt, bro. I'm happy to go into another dimension. I'm complete. So when we look at people's lives, it isn't really the length of their lives, it's the quality. Yet looking around our nation, we can see that the quality of people's lives is going down the gurgler. They're getting worse and worse sicker and sicker. So you've got two options. You can sit around and get ill, or you can do something about it. So the very first part of this journey, in my view, is desire. What is your desire? What is your desire to consolidate your power? What is your desire to become free? What is your desire to perceive the world in a different way? Can you let go of where you find yourself today? You don't have to go crazy, like I did, because I'm a bit of a lunatic. I go over the top on everything. And you don't necessarily have to walk out of your house and leave. But in the end, it's the level of your desire. Because spirit never comes down to fetch you. Spirit doesn't wander around saying, Anybody here want to get realized? Anybody here want to transcend? It's not whistling in the marketplace trying to drum up business. It sits there passively and waits for you to come and get it. So you have to reach up. Imagine yourself listening to this session, and you're actually putting your arm up, and reaching up and saying to that infinite God force inside of you, whatever which way you may want to describe it, Buddha, the Christ consciousness, Krishna, the Tao, whatever, reaching up and saying, hey, I want to change. I want to go beyond where I find myself. Because if I don't, I'll bore myself stupid. you got to want to, and that's the first move. I wanted to, I must say. I had a lot of desire and a lot of tenacity. A lot. I've heard that in some surveys of people that buy these audio programs, it says that they never actually listen to the program. They leave them on the bookshelf so they can look as though they're learning. And of the people that do listen to these programs, many don't follow through to the end. Maybe these people don't really have a desire to change. So, bro, sister, if you're listening to this program and you have got the desire to change, you better get to the end of it. Otherwise, I'm going to zing around to your place and box your little spiritual ears. Because in the end, the laziness of the ego, the self-indulgence of the ego the importance of the ego, will kill you. So at some point, you actually wind up being in a war with yourself. If you let the ego win, then you're bound to fail. So, if you say, I'm going to impose a discipline upon myself. I'm going to listen to these sessions for 30 minutes every day while commuting, say. It's pointless chatting to a friend for 30 minutes in the car, because that's your discipline gone. Then your mind thinks, see, she's weak. She didn't follow through with her commitment. So sit your friend in the front seat and say, hey, listen, shut up for a while. I'm reclaiming my infinite self. I'm listening to session six. And you follow through. Because in the end, if your word isn't law to you, then your mind knows it isn't. You say you're going to do something and you don't. What happens is the mind gets stronger. 
The ego gets stronger. It dominates your life even more. It harasses you more. So if you're coming along this journey with me, make the commitment. And if you don't want to make the commitment, then throw the program out the window. Or better still, give it to someone you don't like. But if you're making the commitment, if you want to be in the show, so to speak, you've got to commit to taking the time to listen. Taking the time to get to the end. Because as we go through these 33 steps, it's going to set you free. It will liberate you from lots of unnecessary weight. So some of the concepts set you free immediately, and you'll get it. And some of them set you free later on. Three months from now, nine months from now, five years from now. When you comprehend what they mean, what they really mean, you'll see things in a deeper way. It's almost like an onion. You can take off one little peel and you see the next skin below it. You take that skin off and you see the next one and so on. You're always going deeper and deeper within yourself. So stuff that you heard 10 years ago, sometimes you hear it again and suddenly you see it at a whole different level, in a different light. So that's what this thing's all about. It's about desire to evolve, desire to become something different. Certainly, I had desire, as I mentioned before, being brought up in Africa and going through a very rigid English education and then into a very rigid English society. I really, really cranked up inside of me the perception that I didn't fit. And of course, there are millions and millions of people around the world that don't fit. In my books, I call them fringe dwellers. The fringe dwellers are not hobos or hippie travelers necessarily, and they're not anarchists that are trying to blow up City Hall. They're just people that know there's something else other than the ego and TikTok and control and the institutions. They're people that know and believe in a different reality, an alternative idea. The fringe dwellers are not necessarily attacking anything. They just don't fit because they've sort of worked their way out of restriction, so to speak. They've worked their way through the popular emotion and the popular beliefs, and they've worked through TikTok and all of that stuff. They live in a different world. And yet, they may still be driving a bus for the city bus company. But in their hearts, they've moved to the outer edge of this human evolution, to the outer edge of the popular emotion that most people consider normal reality. I'm certainly a fringe dweller, and probably you are as well. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been attracted to these teachings. If you don't know you're a fringe dweller, sit down and have a little think about it. I'm sure you bloody well are. You know, like, you're weird, man. You're totally weird. And I'm totally weird. And there's millions of us, weirdos all over the planet, that are actually different in our consciousness. What happened to me is probably what happened to you. As I tried to fit, as I tried to mold myself into the three-piece suit, to mold myself into the English class system, the whole social structure, and trot off to Royal Ascot and get a top hat and all that, and go to the races, and there's the Queen moseying up the track in her little carriage, and everybody's so lardy da I couldn't do it. I couldn't fit. I would laugh and think to myself, what the heck am I doing here? The bottom line comes down to, hey, if you're a fringe dweller, if your mindset doesn't fit, then just agree to not fit. Why struggle? Sure, you've got to do things at work. Sure, you've got to show up at Christmas time and do all that away in the manger stuff, but in the end, in your heart of hearts, what you've really got to do is design a bridge that is going to take you from this side, where it's all TikTok and restriction and not fitting, across a river of consciousness to the other side. And that's where the infinite self dwells. Once you start to look at the world as energy, once you start to look at yourself as energy, once you have the desire to perceive, you will automatically write a different evolution for yourself. Think of it like this. Most people that are into consciousness, that are into working on themselves, accept the idea that life is created by them. If you're imbalanced, things go wrong. If you put out a lot of negative energy, you get a lot of negative results. These are not particularly awesome, shattering concepts for people. 
Most people are beginning to accept, or they already accept, that they create their reality. However, think of this. If you're inside the popular emotion, if you believe what everybody else believes, if you tick-tock along the way they tick-tock along, you're bound to wind up inside the group evolution of your people. You're bound to wind up where they are going. Because if you're not thinking differently, if you're not acting differently, if you don't have a different perception of life, you've got to be putting out what everybody else is putting out. And you'll wind up where everybody else is going. I've asked people in my seminars and lectures, how many of you are prepared to do nothing and just sit and be dragged along in the collective popular evolution? Because if you're happy to do that, you're going to wind up where everybody else is going to wind up. Of all the places I've played, and I've played hundreds of cities, I can think of only one person that ever put up their hand in response to that question. And I said to him, fine, if you want to sit there and go along with the popular emotion, the popular evolution, good luck to you. But most everybody wants to go to something different. But if you think the way that you've always thought, if you do the things that you've always done, if you act in the same way, if you have the same emotions and beliefs, you're bound to wind up where everyone else is going. If you don't fancy that, you've got to change. You've got to select a whole different belief pattern, a different emotion, a whole different way of operating. Discipline, silence, respect for the spirituality within you. You can't have it both ways. You can't just sit and do couch potato and go, yes, oh, that's a lovely idea, oh, yes, smashing, oh, yes, very positive, very nice, oh, lovely, and do nothing. You've got to be action-oriented and you've got to want to. You've got to have the desire to change. And that, of course, is the key. Wishing to evolve. Wishing to change. You've got to remember also that you're not on your own. I believe that the whole of the planet is basically one consciousness. That we're all little microscopic bits inside that consciousness. The whole of the human mind, in my view, is like one great hologram. Each of us one dot in the hologram, you and me. If I change, it helps you. If you change, it helps me. Bit by bit, this whole consciousness thing has spread all over the world. It's kind of crossed religion. It's kind of crossed institutions. It is the journey back to God. You can call God anything you want because I'm sure he, she or it doesn't give you damn what you call it. But the fact is, Consciousness flows out and changes people. So we all wake up. It helps us. We are moving the evolution of this planet forward. So if you incorporate a couple, three new concepts in your mind and you raise your energy a little bit, you consolidate yourself, then that helps other people, especially the people that you come into contact with, that are going to feel your energy, that are going to see the difference. But I also believe, in the general sense, as your consciousness raises, the collective consciousness of all of our people becomes more aware. So we're all pushing energy in the same direction. We're trying to create a more loving, more conscious, better put together society for all our people. Hey, it may take a little while. It may take everybody 500 years to go beyond being so assaholic. But hey, what difference does it make? If you're infinite, it can take as long as you like. In fact, it's cool to think to yourself, at least we're moving forward. At least something's happening. At least we're making some kind of effort. That's the whole point of these 33 steps. To generate a new energy. To generate effort. To accept the discipline. Self-discipline. So that you perceive and look and also understand that you cannot create a brand new energy go to a brand new place and still hold on to where you find yourself now. In other words, if you want to flow down this eternal river of perception towards your infinite self, you've got to let go of the branch that you're hanging on to and just let the river take you. That means you have to face your insecurities. You have to face your fears 
and really look at yourself. Sometimes to look at yourself is extremely painful because what you see is like piles and piles of caca, loads of it. And you think, my God, I'm grim. I'm totally assaholic. I need to join Assaholics Anonymous. I'm so assaholic, it's absolutely painful. Then as you get into that and see how assaholic you are, you can love yourself. You can look in the mirror and say, man, this is one of the world's greatest asses, but I love him. I love her. And I'm going to change her. And that's what's so great about this process. Think of this. If you were perfect, if you were totally angelic, if you were marvellous, I mean totally over the top, perfect, saintly, whatever, you wouldn't be here. The whole point of our evolution on this earth plane is to come down here with all the crud and all the muck and all the violence and all the sickness and the fact that everyone is so dysfunctional and ill and we have to accept it, accept the restriction. Just getting into this physical body is a very restricting experience. You wake up in the morning and there it is, 180 pounds, much too fat, and you have to schlep it around all day and haul it about. Just being in the physical, that's grim. You've got to haul it around. So we accept the restriction. We accept the negativity. We accept the ego. We accept evil. We accept all of these things in order to transcend them. Because if this place were perfect, we wouldn't show up. We wouldn't incarnate into this body. We'd look at it and we'd think, nah, it's much too yawnsome. It's too boring. I'm not going down to the physical. It's just like watching paint dry down there. There's nothing going on. So you are what you are. And you have what you have. And it's all up in the air. It can go either way. But you've got to want to drive it towards that infinite self. You've got to want to come. You've got to want to let go and make the journey. At this point, I want you to come to the next session, okay? No ifs, buts, or maybes. Just get on with it. Good on you. See you at the next session, and don't take long. Because I like my spirituality on the hurry-up. I can't mess around waiting for you, and you can't mess around waiting for yourself. We're going to get this concept, and we're going to get it quick. That's what I like about Taoism. It's short. It's the only philosophy in the world that's only 81 paragraphs long. When I saw that, I thought to myself, bro, this is perfect. I like a philosophy that's only 81 paragraphs long. Tiny little paragraphs at that. Almost like a poem, really. Perfect. Nice and short. Next session. Let's go, bro. Sister. Let's go. Ciao. Congratulations on making it to the second session. Before we get into the actual 33 steps, let me talk to you a bit about the overall concept of the infinite being within. As I said before, I was very influenced by the Tao Te Ching. And what I liked about the Tao was its purity, its simplicity, and the fact that it's not a religion. It doesn't have rules, regulations, and hierarchies. The Tao Te Ching was written about 500 BC in theory, by a person called Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu means old man. So nobody actually knows who the author of the Tao Te Ching was. It has been postulated that the Tao Te Ching is a mixture of several different writers' work because you can see different styles and different ideas in the text. However, as I said, it's very, very short. 
I'd like to read you the first few lines of the Tao and then explain them to you. I'm going to use Arthur Whaley's translation because it is really the definitive translation. The Tao Te Ching, verse 1. The way that we have been told of is not the unvarying way. The names that can be named are not unvarying names. It was from the nameless that heaven and earth sprang. The named is but the mother that rears the ten thousand creatures, each after its own kind. When I read that, my first reaction was, what the hell is this guy talking about? So I asked my venerated teacher one day, I said to him, Boogaloo, how do you get in touch with this Tao thing? And what he said to me was, you can't really understand the Tao or the infinite self intellectually. It's beyond the mind. It's like a riddle, really. The only way to comprehend it is through heightened awareness and feeling. He said, try this discipline. He suggested that I rise at 4 a.m. in the morning and walk in silence for an hour in the forest. So I began the discipline, rising daily, walking in all weathers. In England, if you know England, well, there's plenty of weather here. And I would walk silently through the forest in the dark, not really having a bloody clue what I was doing. But the funny thing is that having done that discipline daily for three years, I eventually got what the Tao was all about. The first line of the Tao says that you cannot put a name to it. And that's a fact. It's a truth. The Tao is the essence of all things that sustain the 10,000 creatures. It is the underlying beauty that comes from the grace of the God Force flowing through all things. That grace, that life force, some people call it the etheric, you can actually see it. Get yourself in a relaxed state and stare at the top of a tree, preferably at sunset. After a minute or so, move your gaze to the area of sky to the right of the tree. Stare approximately where one o'clock would be on the face of a watch. Now, without moving your eyes from the point in the sky that you're staring at, move your attention back to the top of the tree. Remember, don't move your eyes, just adjust your attention. Doing this, you engage your peripheral vision. You'll see the enormous flame-like spirals of energy firing out from the tree in all directions. If you can't do it first time, leave it and try again later. A good time would be after one of the fasts that I mention in one of the later sessions. Once you see the energy, once you know that the God Force runs through all things, once you understand it is the unifying power, the raison d'etre of everything that exists, you'll begin to understand the infinite nature of this dimension, of this evolution. And gradually you'll come to understand the Tao and what the infinite self can do for you. But in order to do that, you have to release from the ego's tight, limited perception and accept the infinite power within you. It comes to an understanding that says, when you are prepared to release and detach and let go, you gain everything. It took me a while to make the turn, to adjust from the crazies that I used to hang out with, and to arrive at a more powerful, placid, serene lifestyle. My quest and my path was fraught with disciplines of every kind. So, in order to do that, I had to put into my quest or my path disciplines of every kind in order to control myself. So I took on nutritional discipline, the discipline of walking in the forest, the discipline of attending meditations and meetings, reading, studying, and taking time aside each day for silence. 25,000 people were attracted to my spiritual teacher over the years, and at each level of the teachings, the disciplines got harder and harder. After a period of about three years, almost everybody had dropped out, to the point where in the end, there were only 72 people left, one of which was yours truly. Eventually, there were only three of us left. It was that tough. The reason why the disciplines were so difficult, and the people dropped out, was that the teaching called upon you to be extremely disciplined and extremely spontaneous. So my teacher would phone and say, there's a meeting next Wednesday evening in southern Spain at 7 o'clock. Be there. 
there wasn't any question of could you make it financially you know did you have the time off could you get to spain was it comfortable are you happy with the idea is it convenient it was just a matter of be there if you didn't want to be a part of the teaching you didn't have to show up but if you went and you were even one minute late you were tossed out forever so you can see how we got rid of people really quickly there were no ifs buts or maybes there was no slack and what I learned was that spiritual growth and getting to a higher awareness is not necessarily convenient that's why most people never make it they want to perceive a higher place but they want to do it from the considerations of the ego and all of the limitations of an ego-based consciousness that often has the energy of a slug in a puddle. It's not doable that way. What Lao Tzu was talking about in the first few lines of the Tao Te Ching was that the world of the infinite self, the world of the Christ consciousness, the God force, the Buddhahood, runs through all things. It is everywhere, but it has no definition. It is only the ego that defines discriminates, quantifies, measures, and creates an edge or framework so that he can understand things. But the eternity, the life force, the etheric, the grace of God, let's say, that is flowing through a plant, a tree, an animal, your human body, the water that flows through the streams, doesn't have a definition. You can define a tree because there is a precise and definite space around the tree where it is not here the tree is, and here's the space around it, where it isn't. But the God force is omnipresent, meaning it is everywhere, so it can't be defined. And of course the God force, if it is present, must also be God, because God is everywhere. The God force and God must logically be one and the same. You can work it out. There's a law in physics that states that no two particles can occupy the same space. So, if the God force is everywhere, and God, he, she, or it, is everywhere, then God and the God force must be one and the same. Because you couldn't have a particle of God existing in the same place as a particle of God force. Because no two particles can be in the same place. So, either you have to have a particle of God force, and a particle of God side by side, and then both of them would not be omnipresent, because there would be places where they were not everywhere, or they would have to be superimposed upon each other, which is not possible. So the God force and God are one and the same. So to reach the infinity within you, you have to first change your mind about definitions. What the Tao says is, it is because of definitions that we limit ourselves. So the Tao says, nothing is high or low. Nothing is intrinsically short or long. No journey is short or long. One could say, well, this journey is a long journey because it takes you four hours to drive from A to B. But it's not long compared to, say, sending a satellite to Mars. And that isn't long compared to sending a satellite to the outer limits of the Milky Way. So the first understanding or the first perception that we have to think about is that the infinite being has no definition. That can be a little unnerving for the ego because the ego likes the idea of my body my people, my house, my car, I am here, I'm not everywhere else. But in fact, what we're looking to do is to expand our heart to where we can understand that sense of infinity within us and where we can see ourselves in the perception of being eternal. Meaning that you existed before you came to the earth plane, you exist now in the physical form and you will exist after you leave the earth plane or after your body quits in the earth plane. So the idea of infinity is a very beautiful concept but it's a very hard concept for the ego personality to grip. I can say to you, think about infinity and perhaps you can vaguely imagine something going on forever. But if I say to you, what does infinity feel like? You'll probably not have a precise feeling inside of you. You may say, oh yes, Stu, I think I know what infinity is like. But thinking you know is only the first rung on the ladder. So what we're looking to do is to first of all get you to accept the idea of the infinite self intellectually. In other words, we're selling the ego personality. 
Then gradually, through discipline, meditation, seeing life in a sacred way, opening yourself up, moving beyond fear, coming to a more compassionate understanding of this planet, you will eventually experience infinity as a feeling. Then you'll be able to say, yep, I feel eternal. I feel immortal. I feel infinite. I am everywhere. The other thing that's very important to grasp early on is that spiritual growth is not necessarily convenient and it's not necessarily comfortable. Not only because you have to discard an awful lot of beliefs and definitions and the things that you hold sacrosanct at the moment, but also because you have to naturally enter within yourself the reality of who you are. As you begin to look at yourself, that creates a little bit of discomfort. It's difficult to learn to control the ego and discipline the mind without it reacting. The idea that something or someone is going to descend upon you one day and raise you up, you know, a great guru is going to touch you on the forehead, Jesus or some angelic being is suddenly going to lift you to a higher plane, I'm sorry, but I just don't buy that. And I'm sorry if that contradicts your beliefs, but energy seeks its own level. Even though something or someone can inspire you or show you the way, in the end, the only way you can sustain a higher energy is to create it from within yourself. In the laws of physics, a subatomic particle can for a millisecond borrow energy and move to a faster orbit around the nucleus. However, the particle can't keep that borrowed energy indefinitely. So whatever energy is borrowed in this second, a split second later it has to be paid back and the particle returns to the energy level it had before. I think your energy and spiritual growth follows the same rules. You can be inspired by a hymn, a fantastic sermon, some great words out of a book, but you can only borrow that inspiration. In the end, raising your energy involves discipline, involves working upon yourself. There's no particular time when you can say, I've done it. It's a perpetual process of unfolding within you forever and ever. That is the only way that you can sustain yourself indefinitely at a higher level. The very first step of the 33 steps is called I am God. Now you may think, who is this little twerp saying I am God? Here's what I mean. I mean that you have to accept the idea of the God force being within you. Obviously, if the God force is everywhere, it must be within you. But most people either have no concept of God or they externalize God and create an image of God outside of themselves. So they project away from themselves and they say, this person is God, these ideas are God, my mind is God, money is God, sex is God, whatever. The God force is within and you have to internalize that God force and accept that it is flowing through you. When God is outside of you, you can't really use it. You have to internalize it for it to become a truly awesome power in your life. Here's another concept that comes from I am God. I believe that the infinite you that dwells inside you had a vision of what it was going to be getting into in this lifetime. I don't believe that you came here by accident, that suddenly you plopped into this little diaper and thought, what the hell am I doing here? I believe that your evolution here on the earth plane is so powerful, so sacred, so dynamic that the infinity within you had an overview. In the ancient teachings, it was said that the divinity, the higher self as some people call it, could see the first 13 years of life. Not every minute detail, but it could see the family you were going to be born into, your father and mother's strengths and weaknesses, perhaps the absence of your father or mother, the fact that you were raised by your grandparents or in an orphanage. It could see the genetic code and what physical disciplines or traits would develop. It could understand the mindset and the emotion of the tribal situation that you found yourself in. That higher spiritual self, the infinite self, had an overview of how this life would actually develop from the initial programming that you would receive as a child. This idea is quite radical compared to modern religious ideas, but it doesn't necessarily contradict them. It just says that the infinity inside you had a perception. In my life, I've confirmed it to myself, to a certain extent anyway. Because as you develop awareness and perception, you can see that people are not just mind or personality. They're not a set of tribal beliefs. They're not just a physical body. They are a feeling. 
I can watch people going up the street and looking at the etheric, I can see the feeling. As I watch the feeling, I know a lot of things about them. If I was their higher self, which I'm not, but if I was, I could at least be able to tell them from my own limited perception, hey, you have these tendencies, these possibilities. This will happen in the next three months, 12 months, 10 years possibly. But my perception is minuscule compared to the infinite perception inside of you. So if a human can train themselves quite simply to watch people's feelings and comprehend them, how much more or how much greater would that infinite power within you be able to see what tendencies lie ahead, what difficulties and what strengths? So I believe that you had a vision of what you were going to get into. And I believe also that your next point of power in understanding this I am God routine is to accept where you are. Because fighting against where you are, bemoaning your circumstances, crying over the fact that you're not as privileged as someone else, crying because you are privileged and therefore spoilt or something, being upset because you don't have all the physical strengths or knowledge that you need, is ridiculous. You have to relax and accept, remembering that almost everything is reversible. Everything can change. And what you can't change, you probably don't need to change. You can just go beyond worrying about it instead. So say to yourself, this infinity inside me, that part of me which is God, loves and respects this evolution, loves and respects where he or she finds themselves and their circumstances. Now, the circumstances of your life right now might suck. They might be absolutely grim. But in sitting down and not fighting, not resisting, not creating negative energy, negative feelings, negative emotions, you begin an instantaneous healing process. So, if you're surrounded by a bunch of incredibly negative or incredibly grim people, called relatives or mere friends or workmates, rather than fighting that ugliness, rather than fighting your misfortune, rather than being aggravated by the circumstances, love them. Love the circumstance. Look at these people, look at the job, look at your circumstances, look at your family, your tribe, your home, and say, thank you, God, for sending me these teachers. These are my teachers. They're driving me crackers. And what they're teaching me is to not react. What they're teaching me is to transmute negative energy into positive energy, to transmute hatred into at least neutral energy, or if possible, love. These are my teachers. Thank you, God, for sending me teachers. Thank you for allowing me to be here on the earth plane. What an incredible experience. Isn't it fantastic that free of charge, I'm surrounded by 55 assholes that are going to teach me a lot about myself. So if you want to reach that infinity within you, you have to move away from the more rigid definitions of the ego. And let's face it, the ego is very self-indulgent, isn't it? It wants everything to be perfect. It wants to be recognized. It wants it easy. It wants it safe. It wants it cozy. It wants to be paid more than it's actually worth. It wants a lot of stuff that isn't reasonable. And you're going to have to walk away from that and suddenly you're moving from the definitions and the unreasonable agony of the ego to at least a neutral position, saying, this is neither good nor bad. These people are driving me crazy and that's neither good nor bad. These conditions seem uncomfortable to the ego, but in effect they're neither good nor bad. They just are. Even if the conditions from the ego's definition are grim, from the infinite definition, it's all part of your learning experience. It's part of your challenge. It's part of being here. So, I am God says, I'm eternal. I'm beyond the definitions of the ego, beyond death. So therefore, I'm also beyond fear. Fear is a manifestation of the ego. Negative energy is only a contradiction of the ego's opinion, remember. I'm going to be talking more about that later. So the first point that we have here is to internalize God. So if you're driving along in your car right now and you have a concept of God that's outside of yourself, mentally bring God home. Bring God back inside your heart, even though you can't necessarily feel the infinity within you. At least imagine it there. Visualize it there. That doesn't transcend anybody's beliefs. You can still be, for example, a Christian and still believe in Jesus and feel Jesus inside of you rather than Jesus outside of you. If you have a concept of God outside of you, it disempowers you. Because what you're saying is, I do not have a command of my destiny. You're saying that you can't put out positive energy, a different reality, and make a difference and create a change. 
you can't get action oriented and you can't believe in prosperity and get more money. So with the God force within, you can power your consciousness to get you the things that you want. Naturally, the first point of spiritual maturity is accepting where you are, who you are, what you are. And the second part is knowing that you create your destiny. Okay, a part of your destiny was already pre-written when you got here. In your genetic code, in your tribal heritage, in the things that you learnt. But most of it can be changed, adapted, modified for the better. So by internalizing the God force, you can begin to comprehend that the God force within you can be expressed outwardly, can be directed into your life to change it. So you have a power. It isn't some place else. It isn't up on a podium somewhere. And you're this little person down here that has absolutely no power, no volition, no ability. The God force must come inside of you. And once you accept infinity as an idea, then your power begins to grow. You are the God force within. Say that to yourself as an affirmation, three, five, seven times a day. I am the God force within. I can't necessarily feel it, but I'm imagining it in the meantime. The second step of the 33 steps is expanding your inner awareness. You have an awareness that comes from the five senses. And you have an awareness that comes from your logic, your intellectual knowledge, and the awareness that comes from your experiences in this lifetime. But beyond that awareness is an inner awareness, an extra sensory perception. Let me tell you how it works. Once you've internalized the God Force, once you accept that you are a part of an infinite energy that is inside all things, then you're connected to all things. Think of it like this. External reality seems outside of you. But that is an illusion created by a limited point of view. A trans-dimensional being watching the earth plane, watching people's thought forms and feeling the earth would see the earth as one molecule of matter, thought and feeling. It would see all of our evolution inside the one molecule. From beyond the earth plane there would be no internal and external. There would only be the one energy all of it internal. So you're connected to all things, seen and unseen, here and not here. Stranger. Everything expresses, to a lesser or greater extent, the God Force. The machine playing this lesson has some part of God Force in it, because there's God Force in the molecules. That is not as much God Force as in something that's alive, like a worm. And a worm has less God Force than a bird, because the bird is more complicated. And you are more God Force than an animal. And some humans have a greater amount of God Force than you and I have. There are levels. But you are connected. You are the worm. You are the bird. You are the machine. You are the car. You are the air that we breathe. Once you understand that, and once you understand that everything is alive and emits a feeling, then you can understand that you are a feeling as well. You are a thumbprint of energy that is the collective emotion you've developed in this lifetime. You're not so much what you think, you are what you feel. Those philosophies that say, think and grow rich, are not necessarily wrong, but they don't quite go all the way. You have to feel and grow rich. You're a feeling, and everything else is a feeling. So bit by bit, you can begin to place your awareness into things to discover how they feel. How does a seagull feel as it flies? How does this tree feel? How does this situation at work feel? How does this business proposal that the guy in the bars just offered you feel? Is it crooked? Is it safe? Is it legal? Is it comfortable? How do things feel? In understanding that, you expand. Going on from understanding that you're feeling and understanding that you are the God Force within, you have to accept that you can direct that God Force. What that means is, whatever you concentrate upon is what will eventually manifest in your life. So if you believe in disease, you will imbalance your emotion and hasten the disease within you. If you constantly say, this job is a pain in the ass, the infinite energy within you takes it literally and you get hemorrhoids. If you say, I believe in lack, then opportunities miss you. Money falls from your wallet. Somebody steals your car. Ernest Holmes said, where your mind goes, energy flows. And old Ernest was right. We know that. Whatever you concentrate upon empowers you. So if you've been concentrating on negative or adverse things, if you've been concentrating on being overwhelmed, if you've been concentrating on difficulties and dysfunctions, you can be sure that they will be in your hall of fame, so to speak. 
here's a statue to dysfunction. Here's another statue to frustration. Here's a statue that honors struggle. Let's bow down to the God of struggle and give that 15 minutes of your reality. As you decide to change, you're going to discipline your mind. How you're going to discipline your mind is, you're going to police your dialogue and cut out depreciating statements that destroy your energy and make you sick. If someone asks you how you feel, don't answer horrible, grim, life's a nightmare. Answer fantastic. It doesn't matter if your life isn't fantastic. That's only the ego's point of view anyway. The spiritual reality that is your life is fantastic. And it's a very great privilege to be here. Next, you're going to gradually, over time, stop accepting things that destroy life force and affirm negativity. You're going to stop accepting things that destroy your balance and affirm weakness. So at first, your mind will be very strong. You will say, I believe, and the mind says, no, we don't. You will say, I feel good, and the mind says, no, I don't. You say, I think it's going to work, and the mind says, no, it won't. That's the beauty of this battle, of this journey. And you can push against the mind, not wrestling with it so much, just quietly disempowering its negative influence. So when it comes up with a negative thought, you can replace that negative thought, saying quietly to yourself, I don't accept that negative energy. I don't accept that fear. I am a love. I am positivity. Everything flows through me. Everything comes to me for my highest good. And so you start to replace inside the mind the energy that has possibly created so much destruction in your life. An important thing to remember as you become more aware is that daily life, the circumstances of life, are actually external symbols of the inner you. So when you're walking down the street and something strange happens, you stop and watch. Let's say a black cat hops across your foot and does a somersault and crosses the road and pees up against the pub wall. Ask yourself, what does this mean? The fact that you are coincidentally there at that particular moment to witness the cat's antics means the symbol is yours. It's the external world talking to you. It is showing you things about yourself. So by internalizing the God force and by understanding that you have to quieten the mind, you begin to see how the universe is trying to take you by the hand and lead you on. The external internal dialogue comes from serenity. It comes from silence. From the ancient legend of Camelot, we know that Arthur took the sword, Excalibur, from the Lady of the Lake. That Excalibur is power. It is silent power. It's not the ego's power. It's a silent power and it came from the Placid Lake, meaning that the power comes from the serenity of your emotions. You don't have to be perfect to be serene. Tell yourself that seven to ten times daily. I am serene and balanced whether life is perfect or not. You see, we're trying to get you to stop struggling against yourself. As you accept this gift of serenity, then bit by bit your emotions calm down. As your emotions calm down, the power comes up. It's not an egotistical power that you can wield to maneuver people. It's a silent power. It's a power that you will internalize. It's a power that you will use to heal your body. It is a power that you will use that will show you an evolution, a transcendence that is not normally available to people. But you have to learn to guard the power, to guard your energy and guard against the ego trashing it. It's a paradox of the ego that on one hand it's babbling away, trying to build itself up, trying to generate gratifying experiences, trying to maintain its importance. And then in the same breath, it generates negativity to trash itself. Only the ego would believe that in moaning and groaning, things might get better. Essentially, it's calling for its mother to help it. I'll cry. I'll moan. I'll demonstrate the injustice of it all. Save me. Help me. If I bitch a lot, will you give me something for nothing? Will you commiserate? What you're going to do from here on out is you're going to discipline your mind. When you find yourself buying the negative emotion, getting out of control, you're going to stop and mentally change the program. Remember, don't buy the emotion, buy the solution. Expanding your awareness comes from understanding everything is feeling and asking yourself constantly, how does this feel? It's like a muscle that perhaps you haven't used for years, but as you begin to ask, it will show you. Do this. In a silent moment, Ask that infinity within you to show you something in the next 24 hours 
that you've never seen before. A perception, perhaps. An intuition. A different way of looking at things that you've looked at a hundred times before. Then watch carefully and something unusual will pop up and you'll see that the external and internal universe is talking to you. That it loves you in its detached way.